Hi, this is Ed Hammerly from NJ Renewable Energy. Welcome to my how to build a solar furnace. Um, I'm going to go through some tips, how it works, uh, suggestions I have for you, and at first I'll just give you a quick uh, synopsis of what you're looking at here. Uh, basically this is a a solar thermal evacuated tube system that I use for domestic hot water. It's similar to uh, this air uh, solar furnace in the sense that it's capturing heat and putting it inside the house. In this particular case, this is using a fluid. Uh, it's using a glycol mixture to transfer that heat, whereas this is using air. You know, just for the record, uh, using liquid is far better is a far better transfer medium than air. But in this case, you can build these a little easier. They're cheaper. Um, they're less complicated, so there's there's reasons for I suppose using it depends on really what you're trying to do too whether you're doing water trying to heat hot water or just heat a structure, um, but anyway so that's that's essentially the difference of the two things that you're seeing here, um, as you'll see through the glass the the type of of solar furnace I've decided to make was one that used a metal soffit. I thought this was the, first of all, I, the reading that I've done online, it seems to be one of the better methods of doing it rather than the pop cans. Um, the other thing is this is a rather smaller collector. Um, the reason that is, is this is actually a net zero home. So I really did this more of a, as an, a science experiment and just to dabble in some, some solar furnace technology. I'm going to take this, this hot air that we collect and throw it inside the basement and just you know offset some BTUs. But it's really not something of this size that I'm looking to change anything drastically here at the house. Although I will say, if we do put it in, in this section of the home, this is a passive house. This section of the home uses one tenth the energy of a regular home. So actually, this size collector may do far better because the demands inside the structure are far less than a regular house. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing we're trying to determine right now is where to put this. I just have this leaning against the house at the moment. Uh, at this given point, it seems that this location right here is probably gets the most sun. Although we're really not looking to heat right now because it's just it's late September. Uh, so what we're going to do, what I'm going to do, is we're going to wait and see. We're going to give it a little bit more time. Uh, as the sun continues to get lower, as the leaves fall off the trees, uh, there may be a spot on this on this southern exposure here that actually gets more sun during that period of time. So keep that in mind. You don't want to put it somewhere that gets a lot of sun when you don't want the heat. You want to put it somewhere where it's winter and you want the heat. That section of, the, of your home is collecting the most sun. So anyway, take a look at what I've done. I, I have a bunch of tips here. By no means am I an expert in the solar furnace business, but I do have a lot of experience in renewables and passive house design and sustainability. So there's just basic ideas and concepts that, that, that fit all these different types of, of, of uh, development. So take a look at what I've done and hopefully it'll help you with your solar furnace. Thank you. All right, so for any collector, I would suggest there's basically three components. Uh, you have absorption, uh, retainment, and then distribution. And what I mean by that is obviously you want to have uh, uh, a device that absorbs as much of the sun's heat as you possibly can, which is of course why we have it painted black. But also you want that collector, to, you know, you want to have the most amount of square footage you possibly can collecting that heat. Uh, the next part is uh, retaining that heat. Because as soon as that heat gets inside and it gets really, really hot, say it's 150, 200 degrees or whatever it is, that heat's going to want to transfer to a colder uh, area. So insulating is key. Having the glazing be insulated is also important. So we want we want it, we get this heat. We want to hold on to it, but then we want to distribute it, and we want good heat transfer. What I thought, and again, of all the reading I've done and some of the other videos I've seen on YouTube, is that the soffit material is, is sort of is really neat. We we basically are going to pressurize with the fan blowing the air onto the front of the glass on the inside, and it's going to basically come up this area and it's going to be forced to go through these little holes that are all over the over the uh, softening material. And when it does that, it's going to be rubbing against it. And that, that's where we're going to get our heat transfer. We can have a collector that that collects all this heat, but if we can't take it and then put it into the into the house or into whatever structure you're trying to heat, then it defeats the whole purpose. Um, additionally, once you transfer it into the house, I, I see so many people's collectors that have um, no insulation on the piping going to the house or they're sending it through a window and that window is not insulated well or the window is open. Now, you know, you may be losing more BTUs during the, during the nighttime hour through this window that's not insulated well as you're putting in during the day. So 
you, 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 the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So you have to have this, this entire system insulated well on all aspects, the collector, the piping to the house, through the structure and so forth. So here's the foundation of my solar furnace. I've used all pressure treated material, pressure treated one by six and pressure treated plywood, which is five eighths. The size of the box I created is in direct correlation to these two pieces of glass. I had these here at the house. They're dual pane, low E Anderson, uh, from an old Anderson sliding door. I'm going with the premise that the dual pane glass will help me prevent heat loss through the glazing. However, in hindsight, I may have a small problem, and that is that the glass itself has a very slight tint to it. So I'm hoping its insulating capabilities outweigh its slight tinting that will reflect some amount of sunlight away. I used stainless steel screws to secure all the corners. Then it was time to insulate and caulk the box. I used one inch poly ISO insulation. It also has a reflective barrier foil on both sides. Then we begin installing the pressure treated wood strips on either side of the box. This is where we'll attach our metal soffit absorber. These strips go on the ends as well. Now you'll notice that these strips are on an angle. We'll get into it later, but there's a reason for this. Now I cut my metal softening material to size, and then we spray paint it flat black. Once it was all dried, we connected the pieces together, and I've seen on many other YouTube videos of people gluing them together or caulking them or what have you, using some form of adhesive. Here we just used pop rivets. It was quick and easy. Now it was time to drill our two six inch holes, one on the top, one on the bottom for our entry and exit. And there's a reason I went with these six inch sleeves. I see a lot of uh, solar furnaces out there on YouTube and the internet with four inch. Uh, for starters, with a larger sleeve with six inch versus four, you can move more air, but you also can do it at a slower rate. And when you do that, you actually can get better heat transfer. Right? If the air is moving slower across that, it, it can capture more of the heat. Uh, secondly, if you want to go smaller, you can always do it as an afterthought. We can put a reducer on there. Now the bottom hole is going to pierce through the soffit material. This is because we want the cold air coming in from the house to get against the glazing and be on the outside. Now the top hole is going to be behind the soffit material and through the top of the collector. This way, the hottest air that's risen up through the collector is the furthest away it can be from the glazing and also touching the soffit material. So here's another view with the soffit material into the box without the glass on top. The air from the inside of the house is going to come through the hole at the bottom, run across on top of the soffit material, push through the holes, and then go out the back hole. So this is the reason for the angled piece of wood I spoke about earlier. This will give us more air space at the bottom of the collector where the cold air comes in. But at the top of the collector, when the, when the air is really hot, there'll be a bigger space behind the soffiting material, keeping it away from the glazing. Here we secured our soffit material with stainless steel screws. Then we caulk the perimeter. This way, no air can sneak around the soffit material between the box. By the way, all the caulk I used was silicone with a 400 degree working temperature. Setting the glass was the final step. Be sure to clean it very well before you're ready to go. Make sure you also have gloves on because you will put fingerprints on the inside of the glass. That's okay. Okay. In hindsight, if you're going to use a heavy duty glass, I would not have done what I did, which is to have it on the face of the 1x6. I think in the future, I would use a 2x6 and cut a notch so that the glass sits inside. So that's how to build the collector in a nutshell. Once we're finished and we really know where we're putting it, I'll wrap it in aluminum to give it a final look. 
but at this point, the project has cost me about $230. Okay, so here's the moment we've been waiting for. This is when everyone on YouTube shows you the temperature of their collector. And even though I admire their enthusiasm, the truth of the matter, if you're just taking a stagnated temperature of a collector, it really doesn't mean anything. And what I mean by that is it's a rather complicated measurement. In order to really know the efficiency of a solar furnace, we need to have air flowing through it. We need to know how many CFM of air is flowing through it. We need to monitor temperatures, inlet temperatures, outlet temperatures. It can get rather complicated. For instance, you can have a collector that's very, very hot, but once you start blowing air through it, the temperature dives down very quickly. And then you soon realize that it actually isn't absorbing very much heat to begin with. Or you can have the opposite effect. You could have a collector that's very, very hot, and when you blow air through it, it doesn't actually transfer the heat from the absorber into the house. Here's another example. Here is the roof shingles of my home. It's 172 degrees, a fantastic absorber of the sun's rays. However, does that mean it's a great solar furnace? Can it retain these temperatures? Can we distribute them into the home? No. Unfortunately, I don't have the expertise, the data collection tools, or the time to do a thorough test. But the good news is, Scott Davis from Simply Solar has done many tests on the internet as well as YouTube, and he thoroughly goes through how these things work. And it's what I use as the basis for my project. I strongly recommend you go on his YouTube videos, watch them, and if you have the data collection tools, to do these tests yourself. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the capability or the know-how to conduct these tests, I think if you follow my basic principles for how to build a system, you'll be just fine too. And those principles are creating a good absorber, insulating your box, glazing, and distribution lines into your home, and finally, create an energy efficient fan system or design a passive one that exchanges the heat from your collector into your house. If you follow these basic guidelines, I think you'll find yourself with a pretty good solar furnace. Want to learn more about renewable energy, passive house design, sustainability, EV charging, or anything else in between? Contact me at njrenewableenergy.com. Thank you.